it's interesting when we put programs together. Uh, sometimes they speak to you uh, personally. Uh, and, and today's program is unique in that way. As we were putting together the information and I was talking with our, our presenter about it, you know, the, the, the opening phrase is that we're all motivated. Sometimes we're just not motivated to do the things that we know we should. And so the, the value of today's session is we're going to talk about motivation and engagement and staying engaged and being consistent and then also making sure that what you're looking to do is aligned with what will keep you engaged and motivated. And so we are fortunate today to have with us Judy Ryan. Judy Ryan is an award-winning human systems specialist who speaks from experience. She specializes in systems that nurture and cultivate health and wholeness within and among organizations and individuals. She has assisted many to define and sustain alignment of mission, values, and vision, and gain clarity and approval of strategies that result in improved productivity. Her greatest passion is increasing engagement and trust within corporate, government, education, and family settings. She is an innovative trainer, consultant, mentor, writer, coach, and a frequent keynote motivational speaker and a regular columnist for several national journals on topics of emotional intelligence. Please welcome Judy Ryan. Judy. Good morning. Um, <laughs> I'll be first to admit that I'm a bit of a nerd, so I want to just put that right out front. I love systems. I love structures. And my hope is by the end of this presentation, you, call, you can leave with some structures that will be helpful to you moving forward. I do want to just share a little bit of personal, uh, at, at just to start out here, though. Um, I was thinking about you all the other day and um, this particular group, knowing that you're between jobs, and some of you have been laid off, maybe unexpectedly. And I was having a moment where I, I lost a prospect the other day, and uh, it was one I was hoping for. And I went through, I'm doing this personal thing where whenever I go to eat, I set my timer for five minutes so that I can just be kind of in touch with my body because I'm a very intellectual person. I'm always up in my head. And so it's, it's tuned me in. It's sensitized me to different feelings that go through me, and it reminded me of you all because when I lost that prospect, I went through that stage, those things that we go through. And I went through them very quickly because I don't really hold on to that kind of thing. But I went through that stage of thinking, what did I do wrong? How, why me? How come this didn't work out? Wow, I'm disappointed. And then I went through that stage where I wanted to say, well, that person probably wasn't the right fit anyway, that kind of thing. And so um, as I sunk deeper, I realized none of that's who I am. And who am I? And I kinda, all of that happened very quickly just because of the way that I'm living my life and what I focus on and all of that. And it, it reminded me of some of the things that we all go through around those moments when we have disappointment, where we feel um, thrown off. And so Tickled and Inspired is really going to be a presentation about the inside work on that. And I really appreciate being able to present it to you all. So we're going to be talking about the importance of your alignment and the importance of your motivation, your internal motivation, and how important that is to your joy. And sometimes when we have these opportunities in our life, we don't even know what the gift in it is. It could be that the next thing that you're going to do is going to be the thing that's going to uh, lead you to that next level of joy. So I want you to just think about your goals and challenges right now, the things that you're going through. And ask yourself the question, what kind of people do I want and need around me? And what kind of person do I want to be in the face of that, to be able to move through it, to um, uh, get to the best outcome. So first I'm going to talk about the kinds of people there are, and I don't know if any of you have seen Armour's, Monker's work. We do similar work, and this is some of the statistics that we both share. There was a study done by the Gallup organization, and they studied 700,000 American workers. And what they found is that 16% of them are what's called actively disengaged. These are people who are sick and stressed out, uh, they often don't take very good care of themselves. They don't have great people skills. They tend to sabotage projects and people. And they're often using intimidation and negative behavior. And what they found is that this group um, actually costs an organization about $16,000 a year. 
Now, you all probably can think of people in that category right now, maybe sometime even yourself in that category. I know we've all done it at times, but these are people that kind of live there. And I want to just bring this home to you as well with, uh, with children. There are children in our country right now that are being expelled from preschools because they're really in that much discouragement. Uh, there are kids that are being bullied and there are kids that are victims of bullies. There are people that are in gangs, kids that are um, dropping out of school on drugs and alcohol. So a lot of this starts in just our belief systems in childhood and the way that we hold our um, practices for being, becoming good human beings. I think equally disturbing is that 55% of workers were found to be disengaged. And what that means is they were called nine to fivers because they would come to work every day, but they wouldn't um, bring their full game. So they were there on Monday, kind of like, I have to be here. You know, I can't wait till Friday when I can, you know, get out of this place and get my paycheck. So that was sort of the attitude was, if it's not on my job description, don't expect it of me. And often they're wasting time, not really uh, feeling responsible for the time that they're wasting, sort of giving a C-grade effort. So you probably know people that you would say fall into that category. Often they're apathetic and bored. And what Gallup found was that this group didn't really gain any revenue for the company, but didn't really cost any revenue. So it's almost like a warm body being there. And I, I feel almost as disturbed about this group because we settle for this. We settle for this um, state of being mediocre and having mediocre and expecting that that's as good as we get. So you probably know people in this category. Uh, children, the children in this group are the ones that they don't have great people skills. They're not really necessarily getting expelled or anything, but they're just not doing so great. They often get C's and D's when they're capable of A's and B's. They're often um, goofing off, dragging down the attention and the engagement of other kids or other people. And they're usually shirking responsibility, kind of looking for uh, how do I get out of something as opposed to help. The next group is the one that I want to increase the numbers on, because this is the, the happy spot. In this group, uh, only 29% of American workers are considered to be fully engaged. These are people that are good team players. They, uh, they know how to work well with others. They, um, they take a pretty good care of themselves. They're, they're generally uh, happy people. They have good people skills. They're enthusiastic. They'll take reasonable risks. And what they found is that these people will bring an organization about $32,000 a year average across the country. So you can see how important it is, not only for happiness, but even from a, a, a prospective employer. And a lot of employers are looking at this now. They're just becoming into awareness about the importance of this. So it'd be helpful to make a strong commitment to what do I need to do to make sure that I'm fully engaged in my life? What is it that is blocking me from being fully engaged in my life? So before we, well, I'm going to go on with the kids real quick. I almost forgot them. These are the kids that are ready for their jobs and for school, get along with most adults, including their parents. They get along with their peers, and they like to learn, and they're engaged in their learning, and they're engaged in their processes, and they're also helpful not only at home, but in the community, in their churches, in their neighborhoods, that sort of thing. And there's lots of them, too. So how many of you, by raise of hands, would think that most of the time you're hanging out in that um, actively disengaged, kind of feeling negative and uh, pessimistic and cynical? Anybody, by raise of hands? Well, good, good group. Well, one person back there. <laughs> Hopefully you'll feel better by the end of the day. Um, how about that middle group, that disengaged, where you're kind of in that, I have to do this, I have to. I'm not really tickled and inspired when I wake up. Most of the time? Okay, a few more. Okay, good. And then how many of you would say that you are doing some systems and practices that help you maintain a pretty high level of engagement, where you feel pretty positive, pretty um, connected? Good. All right, good. Well, hopefully we'll give you some additional help with that. Some of the benefits of being fully engaged are that you participate more. You're performing better. It's like that feeling of being in love. You know, everything feels better, everything looks better, everything smells better, everything sounds better. So it's important to recognize that this is what it looks like. It looks happy, it looks healthy, it looks connected. When you are fully engaged, you're actually thinking positively. You're emotionally intelligent. You're self-aware. You're communicating effectively. You're acting responsibly, and you're feeling fulfilled, most important. You're feeling it all the way down to your toes. 
in your body, in your emotions, in your mind. Now, one of my favorite charts, and this is an important thing you can take everywhere with you, is kind of um, dissecting and really taking a close look at what is personal responsibility. This is um, going to be about a belief system. It's not necessarily about behavior, although you'll see some examples. I'll give you some examples of behavior around personal responsibility. I don't know if any of you have seen this before, but when we are in a state called other directed, we're in a state of mind where we actually believe we have no choice, that we have to do something. Now, sometimes this authority figure is outside of us. It might be a boss or the IRS, but often it's in our own head. It's Sister Mary Josephine from second grade, or it's your mother or father, or it's some teacher. But when we believe we don't have a choice, then we believe we have to. When we think we have to, one of the reactions we could have is to comply resentfully. And when we do, this is a really key thing, we're completely unaware of how we don't feel responsible for a number of things. We don't feel responsible for the tasks in front of us. We don't feel responsible for the relationships we have. And we don't feel responsible for even our mood or our own consequences. So I'm going to give you an example, so don't worry about this sounding a little cerebral right now. But when we're resentfully complying from this place of powerlessness, we're actually acting and feeling like a victim to ourselves and others. Now, if we don't decide to resentfully comply, what we'll often do is rebel and resist. And in that instance, we don't feel responsible for the task, for our relationships, or our consequences. And we're actually coming from sort of a mean-spirited, um, no, I won't, you can't make me, I'm going to get back at you. I know uh, several men, personally, and it doesn't mean that it's a man thing, but uh, I got in the car and I'll say, you know, how come you're not wearing your safety belt? I'm just curious. And they said, well, I'm not letting the government control me. I said, well, the government isn't even in the car with us. <laughs> That would be an example of an unconscious other directedness, unaware of how I'm actually in reaction as opposed to having free choice. Uh, a couple examples for you on this. Imagine that you're a teenager and your mom comes to you and says, look, your room has been a wreck. I've been on you to clean it. You haven't cleaned it. You're not going to go out with your friends tonight if you don't get in there and clean it. And you believe I have no choices. I have no power. I have no choices. I have to do it. And you decide to clean it resentfully, complying. How clean is the room going to be? A plus? Anybody? It's going to be a C at, le at, at the most, right? As much as you can do and no more to be able to get out of that house, right? Now, are you thinking to yourself, gosh, I wonder what I've been doing to get mom so upset with me that she's now uh, giving me ultimatums? Am I saying, gosh, I wonder how I created that? Probably not, right? You're probably going, she's such a tyrant, I can't wait till I'm 18 and get out of this joint, right? How are you feeling about your own mood if you're stomping around cleaning that room? Is it you that's causing your misery or is it mom? What do you think? It is you, but you think it's mom, right? Okay, if you're not, if you're going to rebel and resist, is the room even on the radar? Is mom and you getting along on the radar? And is the fact that you'll actually cut off your own nose and not go out with your friends to spite her, is that even something that you feel responsible for? See, so that's where we often are operating from and don't know we're operating from. So I'm gonna give you a couple other examples of this. My sister called me one day. She says, I'm in a little tiff with my mother-in-law. And I don't know, I know that I'm conscious enough to know I'm probably a part of it, but I don't, and I'm willing enough to look at it. So will you help me with this? I said, okay, what's going on? She said, every year we do Thanksgiving, and um, somebody takes a turn cooking the turkey. And she said, this year I volunteered to do it. And I said, so what's the problem? And she said, well, I, you know, I told them, you know, I asked them what time they would leave. Now, my sister, she, um, likes to come to my house every Thanksgiving because we do a family fun night. We do like games. And so uh, she went, had that in the back of her mind, but she hadn't told anybody that. So she had volunteered to do this, but she was asking her mother-in-law, um, well, what time are you going to leave? What time do you think you guys will clear out? And the mother-in-law's like, well, why do I have to tell you that, you know? 
And she said, well, well what's, what's wrong with that? I'm cooking the dinner, for gosh sake, and they're getting in this little bitchiness, you know. And so my sister called me and said, you know, she's always trying to control me, and I don't know why she won't cooperate with me, and, you know, she's all upset about it. And I said, okay, first of all, let's slow down for a minute, and let's look at, did you even want to do the, the Thanksgiving? And she said, well, I thought I should. Now, whenever we're saying I should, I have to, I ought to, I'm supposed to, that's just a clue that we're in this belief system. Now, we're going to talk a minute, in a minute about um, the other side of this, what that looks like, and I'll continue the story of her Thanksgiving story. So I'm going to just show you the, um, first I'm going to show you a cost of that side and see if you recognize a couple things in there. First of all, imagine there's a company where there's 500 employees and everybody's making 50,000, just to keep the numbers simple. So the payroll's 5 million. If 70% operated at half capacity, so that's that 55% that are disengaged and that 16% uh, that are actively working against, if they're giving 50% and assuming that the other 30% are giving 100%, there actually is a loss of 1,750,000. Now that's just financially. That's not even the cost of lost dreams, lost um, relationships, lost time training, all of that kind of stuff. So this is clearly not the happy camp. The self-directed side is whenever we remember we always have the empowerment. Now we can even have empowerment under the most dire circumstances. There are stories about people in Auschwitz, Germany who exercised empowerment within those conditions because we always have a choice what we're going to cause, what we're going to feel, who we are, what we're showing up for. When I know that I have choices, I have one attitude I can take on which is a response as opposed to a reaction to the authority figure is I can agree to do things but when I agree under this side I'm actually aware of all the consequences and I'm willing to accept those consequences. And I have a feeling of responsibility for the task, for the relationships, for the, um, my own mood, my own state of being. And that's really what it means to be accountable. Accountability, we can't really hold people accountable because it's an inside job. It's when my attitudes, my beliefs, my response, my feelings, and my behavior all line up. And I mean what I say and I say what I mean. That's what I'm talking about in alignment. Um, when you think about your life, if you find yourself saying, I ought to, I should, I have to, you just haven't made sure that you're doing it from this side. That's all that means. It's a, good, um, it's a good clue to watch for. When I'm in this side, I can also say no. I can disagree. And I'm also willing to accept all the consequences. Sometimes we say no to something for our values, our priorities, um, what's just the right or fair thing to do. But we're coming from this higher self not from that fearful, disempowered, kind of childish self. The um, great thing about this, well, first, before I go on to the next thing I'm going to click on, if you notice, agree and disagree look a, lot, uh, look a lot like comply and rebel on the surface, right? The behavior, if I'm agreeing, I'm doing it. If I'm complying, I'm doing it. But they feel very different, right? I know this is a bit of a crude example, but if you comply to have sex with somebody, it's very different than if you agree to have sex with somebody. You can feel the difference. It's the same with this. When somebody's rebelling and they're complying resentfully, you feel it. You feel it in the way that they're presenting to you. You feel that uh, feeling of, all right, fine, I'll do it. And you're thinking, on some unconscious level, okay, I'm going to get about 50% output. Right? So um, it's not about the behavior. It's about the, the intention behind it and the centeredness behind it. When we're in the self-directed, we can either um, agree or disagree, but we also have what's called third option because we're not doing knee-jerk reaction. We're doing um, thoughtful contemplation in this mindset. And all that I mean by that is that we, we pause a breath to say, what am I feeling and what do I want? And then we can create other options that aren't yes or no. So my sister, what happened with her was I asked her, I said, well, did you really want to do Thanksgiving dinner this year? And I said, I want you to just pretend it's off the table and you're, you're in the deciding place again. So just take a breath and ask yourself, do I want to do it? And she said, you know, I really do. I really do want to do it. She said, but I'm also conscious in this moment that I want to do it only if they're out of the house by 6.30 so I can get to your house for party night. Like she had forgotten to like notice that information. 
And if she had noticed it, she could have said to her, her husband's family, um, uh, you know what, I'd love to have it this year, but only if, if it's okay with everybody that we're done by 6.30, because I need to go to my sister's, I want to go to my sister's for party night or game night. And um, then they could have negotiated whether that worked. If it didn't work, somebody else might have taken it on. But do you see how different? Because what was happening was she, on some level, wasn't feeling great about her decision, was feeling a bit victim-y about it, and was feeling a bit resentful about it, and didn't know that she was the author of all that. She thought it was her mother-in-law being unreasonable. Um, give you one last story that's work-related. A woman um, that I was working with, she got fired from a job. And she said, I don't know what happened. She said that uh, she had asked her boss off work for a vacation like two months in advance. And her boss said, no problem. So she had it on her calendar. So about a week before her vacation, she says to her boss, now just remember, I'm going on vacation next week. And her boss says, well, that's fine, but I've got a list of these things you have to do before you can go. And she went to the place of, I have to do those. I don't have a choice. And, and it was like contingent upon her getting off for the vacation. So what she did was she did about eight of ten things on a list. And she didn't get to the other two. Now, in her mind, she thought, I shouldn't even have to do these at all. I already had permission two months ago. What is the deal with this? She's lucky that I'm doing eight of them. So part of her resentfully complied, and part of her rebelled and resisted, and she lost her job and did not see her own part in it. Now, what she could have done had she been more aware in that moment is when her boss said to her, you know, you got to do these 10 things in, you know, in order to go on your vacation, she could have sat with that and said, what am I feeling and what do I want? And if she would have stayed with that just a little bit, she would have probably gone to her boss and either said, yes, I'm willing and have been willing because of her own motives and her own values, or no, and had a conversation about why, or maybe even other options like, you know what, I know I, I want to be able to help you with these 10 things, but I want to make sure that um, they're not contingent with my vacation, but I'll do everything I can to get people on board with them or whatever. So there's lots of things she could have done. But because she was not willing to slip into this side, whenever we're not in this side, we're actually causing harm to ourselves and others. Even if it looks on the surface like we're doing the good stuff, even if she'd done all 10 and kept her job, and had that resentment, that would have had an effect on her, her coworkers, everything. So you can see how important it is to recognize when we're doing this. Does anybody have any questions about this? Because this is really important to how to maintain your own equilibrium. Okay? Let me see if we're on track here. I'm off a little bit, but I'll go a little faster. All right, so one of the things that um, uh, I use a lot in my work is based on the work of Alfred Adler, and he was a contemporary of Freud, and I love his work, and he was, I think, ahead of his time, because a lot of what he taught really kind of equaled uh, the playing field for people. He showed us how we're more alike than different, and it's important that we recognize that so that when we're working in jobs and we want to be successful in our next job, that we know how to understand ourselves and others, which is part of really emotional intelligence. So to be fully engaged in your life, there's four things you need to feel. If you remember nothing else from this presentation, I hope you remember this, because this is important to measure everything you say and do and engage in in your own life against. Every person needs to feel empowered. They need to feel that they have a voice, that they have influence, that they have potency. Uh, adults need it and children need it. Every person needs to feel lovable. We need to feel that who we are uniquely is delightful to other people, even if it's different, even if it's you know, off, out of sync. And we need to have an experience of feeling that way. And in our culture, it's not as politically acceptable to be touchy-feely and appreciative and all that. It's, it's more acceptable to connect and, and, and uh, get together with people through negative means, actually which is one of our uh, core needs, is also to feel connected in a sense of community. And a lot of us, um, we so desperately want to be connected, but we're doing things that we're afraid, that we have to hide, because we're afraid that we're going to ever do something that would cause us to be disconnected. And so it's like we're working against ourselves. I want to be connected, but I've got to hide from you so that you don't find a good reason to disconnect from me. And we also need to feel that we're making a contribution and to feel that our contributions are welcomed and that they're appreciated and that they're received. 
And right now, if you're between jobs, it might feel as if you're not being able to do that. And I want you to know you are. I mean, even right in this moment, you're contributing. By contributing to your life, by contributing to everybody in this room. So you're always given opportunities to contribute. A lot of times, people are all of these things, but they don't feel that they are. They don't feel because they're not looking for where they are. They're looking for where they're not. Now, the important thing about this is, one of the things I love about this is, even somebody that we think is not like us, a coworker, a uh, person that maybe a drug dealer on the street corner, if the first place they ever felt connected and uh, part of something was in a gang, but they're going to override their conscience, their fear of imprisonment, all kinds of things to, um, to get these needs met. And, and what's important to know about this is that we don't often um, live our lives fulfilling this. It's like we have a vitamin deficiency and we're not aware of it. And we're even doing things in our environment that actually um, take those feelings away. Okay, we're, talk we're doing negative internal things and negative external things. So one of the reasons we do this is because we have a culture where we use a lot of control. And um, some of the examples of this are um, an autocratic model, old style autocratic model, where the belief we hold about people is they can't be trusted. I have to make them do things. Think about it whether you have children, we do this, whether you are um, in a job, whether you've been a manager or been managed. This approach is about the leader setting the goals, the people becoming accountable to that leader's uh, demands or policies, procedures. What happens in that kind of autocratic model is that people will do what they're told from that resentful compliance or they'll rebel and resist. You'll have some version of other directed. And these are all um, approaches that could be done simultaneously. Surprising to a lot of people is rewarding and incentives. There actually, there's tons of research that a lot of us are either unaware of or we're so conditioned to believe it's a good thing to reward people that we don't ever question it. But um, it's been shown over and over again in studies that with people, not animals, but people, uh, rewards actually work against um, creating greater commitment, greater engagement. Um, people that generally are high performers and win a lot of rewards would have done it anyway, is what they also found. You know, they're driven by something else. But the belief we hold about people when we do any carrot and stick kind of dynamic is that they're basically lazy and selfish and I have to do some kind of outward thing to get them to do the right thing. Um, the leadership approach is to motivate people. The accountability approach is you've got to achieve my quotas and goals. And what happens is we actually keep um, creating a dynamic where people are going to hide their mistakes because my reward's going to be in jeopardy. I'm going to be competing with you for the reward. So it creates a scarcity mindset. It creates a dynamic, well, what are you going to give me now? And then sometimes we get resentful of people. I know parents all the time say to me, well, how come these kids are so gimme, gimme, gimme? And it's like, well, you've been carroting them forever. So we actually get people that rush. Um, I'll tell you a quick funny story about this how it diminishes the um, intrinsic motivation of a person. There's uh, this really wonderful writer named Alfie Cohn. He wrote a book called Punished by Rewards, where it's just, just filled with research about this. And he tells this story about this old man that lives in this apartment. And in the apartment, uh, there's these high, uh, little middle school nearby, and there's these kids. And they start yelling up at him in the window. And they say, hey, you stinky old man. And you know they're calling him all these terrible names. And, he yells down to them, hey, if you keep that up for a little longer, I'll, I'll give you all a dollar. And they're like, what? So they, so they keep it up for a little while. So he comes down, and to their surprise, he gives them all a dollar. He says, now, if you come back tomorrow at the same time, I'll give you all, I'll give you all a quarter. And they say, OK, fine. It's not as good as a dollar, but we'll come back. So they come back, and they even bring some friends with them. And they're all yelling and having a good time. And he comes out with a roll of quarters and goes, great job. You know, He gives them all a quarter. And he says, now, if you come back tomorrow, I'll give you all a penny. And they said, a penny? Forget it. And they'd never bothered him again. <laughs> now, the reason that that's funny and also true is because he was able to play on that idea that um, if, I get, if I take responsibility for their motivation, they won't care for the thing that they were doing it for in the first place. Like, they were enjoying heckling until he got to divert them away from it. And that's actually what rewards do. Um, Measurement driven is kind of similar. A lot of uh, focus on grades or evaluations or any kind of thing that we grew up with. Um, it's basically, you know, you've got to please me. I've got to give you my thumbs up. 
Uh, my job is to tell you you're okay. And then you become accountable to meeting my standards, my ideas of how things should be done. And what you end up creating are people that are pleasers. They're doing things to get something from you as opposed to being in service. Now the downside of this in terms of engagement and living a life that's tickled and inspired is that it's all about extrinsic motivation, being motivated from the outside in. So we're gonna be talking about being motivated from the inside out. So the model that I really like that everybody can do internally with themselves is a responsibility-based model. The belief you hold about yourself and about others are that people are and like to be great and when they're not acting great, they're discouraged. And the way they're discouraged is in one of those four core needs. And even if they don't look discouraged, they might look pompous and downright evil, it's truly that they're, they're discouraged in one of those four. And uh, the leadership approach you want to take with yourself or others is wise counsel. You want to mentor yourself. You want to guide yourself. You don't want to have to control yourself. You don't want to have to manage yourself that way like a force, an overpowering kind of thing. You don't want to have to um, try to incentivize yourself from something outside of you. Now, you can incentivize yourself with some things inside of you, and that's what we're going to be talking about in a little bit. So people own their own tasks, they become accountable for their own performance, they become basically self-directed and fully engaged, okay? So that's the happy path, the self-directed, the intrinsically motivated person. But why are we so attached to control? You know, a lot of us think we're not, or when we see we are, we're like, what's up with that? So I wanna just talk about that for a minute. A lot of people say I'm longing for the good old days when people knew how to behave. You ever think that? Man, in the good old days, those kids sure knew how to not, how to treat their elders better, that kind of thing. Well, think about it that way. Well, think about it as a manager. Why are people so rude when I'm paying their paycheck, that kind of thing. Well, it hasn't been that long ago that we came over from Europe because we were fleeing oppression. We were fleeing um, force and that command and control autocratic, uh, you know, judgment kind of thing. But what happened is, even though we came over here and we created this on paper equitable sort of arrangement between people with the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and you know, all men are created equal and all of that, in reality we set it up that some people were superior and some people were inferior. And the big S represents some people held the power. And even at that time, the power was considered authority, like legitimate authority. Who was down there in that little eye? in our country. Anybody? Slaves. Slaves. Anybody else? Women. Women. No vote. No vote. Who else? Lower class. Lower class. Children. Children didn't have any say in anything. They were put in work, work situations and things. So whenever you have a superior inferior dynamic, you have a win-lose dynamic, right? Whenever you have a win-lose dynamic, these are the feelings that are associated with them. The person in the lose position always feels the fear, hostility, revenge, resentment, anger. Now what happens is, sometimes this group says, well, we might be in this lower class, inferior group, and might even sort of believe it at times. But they're going to actually band together and create some power. Now that power is not considered authority. It's viewed as rebellion, right? But what happens is, if you're in other directed, you will actually create a win-lose dynamic. Now there are people who decide to not do it from other directed. They do it from self-directed. Those are the people like, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi and you know, people that create a new experience without having to go to retaliation. Because what happens is this group will sometimes gain power and overpower that group. That's what happened with the unions. Some of them were so corrupt that they um, really took advantage of that shared power. Um, same with the, the uh, between the races, between men and women. There's still a lot of that going on. We're not that far along. So we just have to be aware of that. This dynamic is always other directed. It's always um, not fully engaged in the truth of who we are, okay? So what's your number one relationship to manage? What do you think? Yourself, right. 
Sometimes when I ask this of managers in a company, they'll say, well, my direct reports. But it's actually yourself. So if you can't manage yourself, if you can't manage your own character, your own uh, time, all of that, you can't, everybody's going to rise to the level that you're at. It should have at least a third of your time. Okay, so let's assume that you've now done that. What's the second most important relationship for you to manage? What do you think? I can't hear. Family? Family like your children? Okay, that's not it. What else? Anybody else? Hmm? What'd you say? Your goals? No. The, it's a relationship. You want to manage your relationship with your authority figures. I wrote an article on this because I realized I had some issues with my authority figures at one time, and the article was called You're Not the Boss of Me. And it talks about all the ways that I would go into a disempowered state when with a boss or with a client that I felt had the authority. So I wouldn't say the things I needed to say. I wouldn't have the conversations I needed to have. For example, I'd have a, a company owner say, I will show up at all, my pro all the programs. I will, I'll lead the charge. And they wouldn't show up at the programs. And I'd hold the programs anyway. Instead of going to them and saying, hey, I had to cancel the program because you said you'd be there and you weren't there. And being willing to do those things and walk away from them, knowing that the project can't succeed without that authority figure doing what they're supposed to do. So if I'm leading people in a company and I can't deal with my authority issues, I won't be able to help them deal with theirs. So when you're working in any environment, as you go into your new jobs, whether you're in management or whether you're in a position under a manager, if you don't have this worked out, you're not going to be able to be functioning or helping the people around you effectively. So those, you, those have authority over you, without their um, support or consent, it's going to impact you negatively. Okay. So you should have at least a quarter of your time Really put into that. A lot of times we don't delegate time. Put it aside and say, you know, am I, am I right with this? this? Am I right with this person? Am I handling this? Am I learning the skills to handle, the communication skills, the, uh, you know, negotiation skills, all of that? What do you think that now is the most important relationship to manage? Anybody? The ones, the people under you? Wrong again. <laughs> it's your peers. See, that's another thing. If you don't have your relationships cleaned up with all your peers, you cannot help the people that have poor relationships with their peers. Those over whom you have no power and who have no power over you, but they can make your life miserable, right? So another quarter of your time. So it doesn't leave a whole lot about managing the people that report to you, because actually I would encourage you not to manage people that report to you if you go back in a position of management. I would have you develop them, lead them, which is different than manage them. Okay, so let's talk about intrinsic motivation. I want to make sure I'm... Still a little off, but I think we'll be okay. We're making up time. All right. You all have a handout. I'm going to be referring to that handout a little bit, but um, it's the front page. But most of you, do you know what intrinsic motivation is? Anybody? What do you think it is? It's a, you, right in the front. It's uh, your, uh, where you get motivation from. Within. From the inside. Okay. Another way to look at it, which is not such a fancy word, is just loving what you do. It's really being connected to that and loving who you're being while you're doing it. All right? So let's talk about what is important to intrinsic motivation and what we often miss around it. A lot of people go into a job or they bring people into a job and they focus on their skills to do the job, right? But we don't necessarily focus on the internal reasons why we do the things we do. So we want to talk about the four intrinsic motivators because if we've been using a lot of external motivation to motivate us even today, whether it's those authority figures in our head or the rules or some other thing external to us, we will have weak intrinsic motivation muscles. Think about it as if you've been around laying in a bed a long time, your muscles would be pretty weak. And that's how our intrinsic motivation muscles are. So we want to actively, proactively 
um, start building those up. The first thing I want to talk about is that when we do a task, the first thing we want to address is the purpose for the task. Now, if you don't address the purpose and you skip over it, you're, you could be the most skilled person in the world, but if you don't understand the meaning of why you're doing something and it isn't something you have clarity around and that you approve of the meaning of it, then it will not be something that will sustain you actually doing it. Make sense? So the task purpose, the self-management activity is that you want to be asking yourself, is this worth my time and energy? And that includes whatever job you're going to do next. If you're going to do a job for just the money, but you're not excited about the task, you either got to find a reason to do it that excites you or get a different task that you're going for. Okay, because that's the place where you're actually making a commitment to something. The next one is uh, the task activities. So there's the purpose and then there's the action. The purpose and then the action. The activities, the management um, of this is to ask yourself, are my activities from freedom? When that woman was told she had to do those 10 things and she did them but they weren't from freedom, or maybe you want to do a job and you want to have some say in how you're going to accomplish it that's going to all impact how motivated you feel. If you're working at a job where you have no wiggle room and you're a person that needs wiggle room, well, you want to consider that when you go into that job because you want to have some choice. That's that state of empowerment and that way of contributing that we want to contribute. The next intrinsic motivator is the competence. Um, how do I monitor that I'm doing okay? And how do I become okay when I have a skill that's not something I'm familiar with. Like when I'm working with organizations and transitioning to them uh, to where managers aren't managing anymore, they're actually developing people, that's a new skill for a lot of them and they don't know how to do it very well. So how do I make sure that I am in a, an environment where I can learn those skills, where I'm supported to learn those skills and I'm not going to feel embarrassed if, you know, as I'm learning that process and how will I know when I've gotten there and all of that. Now a lot of people focus on this without focusing on the other two. And then the uh, fourth one, which is something that we underestimate, is our sense of progress. A lot of times in our life, we make tremendous progress and we don't even see that we have. Even right now, in whatever process you're in between jobs, you have made tremendous progress in the way that you've addressed things. And you probably haven't even recognized that you have. And it's very important that you do, that you look for all the places where you made new choices, where you're making good choices now, even choices like being here today, and, and acknowledge those and celebrate those and see all of the people that aren't here, and you are. So those are some things that we don't do. And um, a lot of times, my job with people will be showing them where they've made progress, and they're like, well, yeah, but, well, yeah, but, because they're so focused on where they haven't made progress, okay? So let's talk first about a sense of meaningfulness. In the sense of meaningfulness, I commit to my purpose. I'm looking at things like, is there cynicism in me? Now, right now, I'm talking about your internal climate. If you become a manager again, this will be useful to you. If you're a parent, this will be useful to you in helping other people. Because the leadership role is to inspire people at this level, to help them get tapped into their inspiration. But for you right now, just focus it inward. Am I in any state of cynicism? Remember when we were all in first grade, kindergarten? If somebody asked this group in kindergarten, how many of you can sing a song or dance? How many of you think we would have raised our hands? Yeah, all of us. Pick me, pick me, right? By fourth grade? How many of us? Yeah, yeah, not that many. So we want to recognize, gosh, we are, you know, we put ourselves in a cynical state because we choose to be in a cynical state. Actually, we bought into it. It's our choice to be cynical or not cynical. Um, we want to look at our clearly identified passions. Uh, how do we get in touch with our exciting vision? And we'll be doing some exercises on that after the break today. And um, what are the relevant task purposes for what I'm doing? So, Somebody, uh, I don't know if there's anybody that would be willing to read, what are the questions, the internal questions on that particular uh, sense of meaningfulness? Would you be willing to read that on the front page? Those questions, yes. Mm -hmm. Oops, somebody's bringing a mic to you. Yeah. 
Right. So that's the kind of question you would ask yourself. Do you see? If there's a place in you that's feeling like, I can't do anything right, I'm, you know, I'm in an Eeyore space, what will you do about it? Make that the most important thing you do if that's where you're stuck. Uh-oh. I'm not plugged in up here. We got plenty of power. We just got to plug in. It's a good metaphor. Okay. So a lot of times, this is where we're stuck. If you're not waking up tickled and inspired, it's possible that this is where you're stuck. It may not be. If it's not, then we'll, it would be one of these other ones. And you can kind of whiz past that. When you're working with other people, if you get in a management position, you want to notice, is that where they're stuck? If that's where they're stuck, you don't go forward until you work through that part with them. And a lot of people will ignore that because we don't feel like we know how to do that very well. If you don't know how to do it well, find a way to learn how to do it well because you cannot bypass it. I'm telling you, you're going to have a mediocre experience if you bypass it in yourself or in others. And here's why. The sense of meaningfulness. People need meaningful drama, struggles, challenges, and triumphs. We think it's a bad thing sometimes, but actually we're pretty bored if we don't have it. Right? We all need something. We need to feel that there are some challenges to overcome. You know, even when I think about sports, a lot of people think it's all about winning this prize. It's really not the award that we're really so compelled to watch. It's watching people master uh, something where they're overcoming. I mean, it's just incredible the amount of determination people have when you see them master something. Um, often, um, we need to be in service, and we're so focused on survival, we forget about service. So when we remember, this is important to me to be in service, we won't make desperation um, decisions. Okay, we'll make decisions about, is this really the best place for me to play? And we need a heroic myth or journey. If we don't have it, um, our life feels, oops, our life feels um, empty or meaningless. We feel alienated, and there's an angst um, that we can feel, okay? We just get through. We're that nine to fiver. I'm just here to get my paycheck. Okay, so the uh, second intrinsic motivation is um, a sense of choice. This is where I choose my activities. And I actually want to do an exercise at this time around choice. Can I have uh, five volunteers? And one of them has to be somebody that likes, um, really likes chocolate with almonds. Anybody? Can I have some volunteers come up? Anybody? I just need five. Okay, what, what, are, you the, are you the chocolate fanatic? Okay, come on up. Come on up. You'll be the chocolate. Well, there you go. Speaking up. Come on up. Okay. Two more. Come on. We need a couple men. Yay. Okay, one more. Now, I forgot to tell you, this involves ropes and blindfolds. Is that okay with everybody? I'm actually serious about that. And a chocolate bar. Now, I'm going to probably, because of the fact that somebody could fall off the stage, I'm going to have you come on down here. And everybody, if you can't see, just stand up or move around a little so you can see. So, um, what's your name? Christina. Christina. Okay, Christina. This chocolate bar represents all your hopes and goals and dreams, everything that you want in life, your next job, whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, I want you to take this rope and I want you to tie it around your waist like a shoestring bow, you know, just a tight shoestring bow. Oops. Now, what I want you guys to do is I want you to put this around her, uh, like just like this. I don't know if you guys can see. Just kind of loop it around one time so that you got like a, like she's you're tethered to her. Okay, okay? tie it kind of tight. All right. Um, well, yeah. I don't, I don't know if I do that, but you can if you want. Okay. All right. There's this. Thank you. That's a good idea, David. This, this. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is have you put a blindfold on Christina. Okay. 
See, you didn't know what you were getting yourself into. OK, now what I'm going to do, you don't put that on yet, put that on in a minute. I'm going to take this and I'm going to put this somewhere in the room. And you're not going to know where it is, but they are. And their job is to get you to it without any words, only using the ropes and safely. OK, you guys got it? So go ahead and put your blindfold on. OK, no words. Oh, look, at she's directing her whole show here. And make sure you put that where you can't see. There you go, Christina. OK, safely and no words. Okay, okay, great job. Now, just like in life, sometimes when you get what you went for, somebody snatches it away before you get a chance to enjoy it fully. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do here for a second. I want you to go ahead and give that blindfold to one of the people around you, and I'm going to get some other blindfolds. Okay, Christina, this candy bar still represents your hopes and dreams and everything you want, okay? You guys all get to put a blindfold on now. Uh -oh. And no cheating. Now, as soon as I, they are all ready to go, I'm going to place this somewhere. You're going to know where it is. They're not. Now, their job is to not cooperate with you in getting there. And you can do, you can do, <laughs> you can do anything you want. You can plead, you can negotiate, you can figure it out. You guys' job is to not cooperate with her, and um, her job is. Uh huh. You still have the rope. I've got one. Oh my goodness. All right, you guys ready? All right. Someone goes this way. Going this way. Go this way. <laughs> hey, so I've got this chocolate bar that uh, I'm willing to share. So how about we uh, come this direction? <laughs> how about um. um we want cash. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to stop you for a minute because I don't want anybody to get pulled, fall over. Um, Anita, what motivates you? Besides money. <laughs> <laughs> that is my number one. Unfortunately, I'm trying to work on that. <laughs> okay, so Christina, I'm going to interrupt so, you for a second. Why wouldn't you just take the belt off? I could do that. When yeah. I yeah. So you can go ahead and take off the belt. <laughs> All right, you guys. You guys can take off your blindfolds. That's really what I wanted you all to see. <laughs> and the chocolate bar's up here, Christine. OK, so how many of you guys thought of taking the rope off? Anybody? One person back there? Anybody else think of taking the rope off? After more discussion, she would take the rope off. So you, you in the back who, did, who knew that she could have taken the belt off, how come you didn't say to her, why don't you take off the belt? I figured it was up to her. You figured it was up to her, OK. So if you were watching somebody trying to get their goals and dreams, and you knew that that was their, the answer to their life, would you, would you stand by and not tell them what to do? Pardon? Right, right. We didn't know all the rules. Yes, that's the thing. So. Here's the thing, but we're often driven by rules. Like, think of the four people that were around her. I don't know where you are in the audience now, but would you have 
Had you known these were truly her goals and dreams, would you have fought to keep her from them in your real life? No, you wouldn't have. So why'd you do it when I told you to? Right, but what if I'm Hitler? Because you want to notice how quickly we fall asleep to our own values and our own choices. Our choices become what's the rules. Like the ropes are those limiting beliefs. When we're little kids, we don't know what's what. We don't know how to maneuver to our goals and dreams. We do have to rely on other people to get there. But what happens is we become asleep to other choices, right? Like choices of speaking up, of taking the rope off, of having the more direct route, of being supportive when an authority figure doesn't make sense. Like we don't stop and say, what am I feeling and what do I want? I had a, a woman that I did this with at a religious function. It was amazing because I've done this probably about 80 times. And she had, uh, she had gotten up and she had given this amazing testimonial about how God had released her from her bonds. And it was, um, it, everybody was crying. It was just an incredible story. When she did the rope exercise, her rope fell off the first half. And I even went up and tied it for her. Same ropes I use every time. And the second half, her rope fell off again. I'd never seen this. I just thought it was very metaphoric that that happened. And um, what do you think she did? Do you think that she walked free to the candy bar? She put the rope back on. She not only put it on, she tied it in a knot so it wouldn't come undone. And then she even helped everybody retether themselves to her. And I said, do you see what's going on? Like, you've even prayed for and had evidence of being freed, and you are actually reinstating limitations. And that's what we do. We all do that. So I want you to recognize that we have choices about what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, when we're going to do it, why we're going to do it. Ask for things that you want. You know, there's a, a story about Best Buy where they had a results-oriented work environment where they took a group of people and they gave them um, outcomes. And they said, you guys can get them done any way you can get them done. And they, had, they got their outcomes done in four days and had uh, Thursdays that they all went golfing and did stuff. And they produced 20% greater than the groups that didn't have any say over it, that didn't have any choice over it. So um, fight for where you have a choice. Look for where you have a choice. Sometimes the most obvious things are right in front of us, and we will resort to force, or we'll resort to begging, or a place of disempowerment, instead of, what am I feeling and what do I want? What's possible here? Okay, so that's what I wanted you to see. Um, in um, a leadership capacity, it's delegating authority. It's trusting yourself and others. Um, it's um, making sure that there's no threat to you as you're making choices and deciding new things creating the dynamic with people so that that's not going to be a problem. Um, having a clear purpose about why you want to do something a certain way. I, I see a path that's quicker. I see taking off the rope would be a quicker path. Make your choices have some sense to them. Okay. So uh, what are the questions? Would somebody read one, some of the questions for that? Would you read them? Just read real loud. Well, there's a the microphone. Here we go. Thank you for that, by the way. How will I stay awake to new choices and determine regular, regularly what, what I can and what uh, to do? Yeah, what I can okay. and what I want to do. So that's one of the questions. So you all you kind of can see all those. You, you could read them all if you would. What indicators can I set up to make me more present to my choices and my progress in acting on them? How will I encourage myself to take more risks, to stress, stretch in the variety of challenges in my choices? How and when will I communicate the purposes for my choices to others so I strengthen, validate uh, them to me? How will I get exposure to new information about various choices? Okay, so when we get into the second half today, we're going to be talking about some of your vision, your choices, um, ways that you can speak it so that it comes into being more, so that people start to support your what it is that you're choosing. Even for myself, my own little, uh, little mechanism of five minutes before I eat, setting a timer so that I'm tuning in to me. That's one way that I'm more aware of what am I feeling, what do I want. A lot of times when I'm even going to grab food, for me, that's an indicator that there's feelings there, that there's something that I want to speak or say or do that I'm not aware of, OK? Mm -hmm. So come up with those for yourself, whatever those are. Maybe it's quiet time in the morning where you sit down and say, what is it I want to do today? What does I want my day to stand for? What's my intention? We did the rope exercise. 
The reason that people need choice is they need to see that their views and choices matter. They need to be and feel like a contributor. They need to be treated as adults and given opportunities to make decisions. We all need to give those to ourselves, to be curious, to take risks, to innovate, to be proactive, get, get that sense of ownership. If you don't feel ownership, there's probably something you want that you're not asking for or that you want to, a way that you want to innovate that you're not um, allowing for. Without it, life feels like it's according to someone else's plan. Um, that your own initiative isn't important, that's that feeling of being disempowered. So create as many choices as you can so that you are feeling that state of empowerment. The third is um, our sense of competence, making sure that we have the skills we need, making sure that we have the safety to learn new things and not be worried about making mistakes. Um, how to do things without necessarily comparing them to everybody else. You know, not um, judging yourself so much. When we're focusing on the sense of competency, the reason we need to do that is we need to know that we're doing well at things. We need to have, be our own, um, we need to have our own report card. Not because somebody else is going to give us a thumbs up, because we need to be able to give ourselves a thumb up. We want to make sure we have the right amount of challenge. If you're in a job or you're going into a job and you want more excitement, up the level of which you're going to like stretch into the next goal. Do some things that you're afraid to do. You want to master those skills. And if you don't focus on doing that well, you'll either take on things that are too challenging without getting the support for your skills, or you'll um, take on too little challenge, which will be boring to you. Okay. And then the last, um, uh, the sense of progress is um, really making sure that you're tracking milestones, that you have goals that you feel excited about achieving, that you're making sure that you're on track with those, that you have people witnessing those so that they're, um, they're able to acknowledge the contribution that you're making. And that you can see the, the improvements and that you can always be recognizing those. And those will fuel you. These are all actually the intrinsic rewards the rewards. It's okay to reward ourselves inside because that's not the same as being carroted and manipulated by somebody else over their agenda. And then create celebrations around where you are succeeding. Okay? The reason a sense of progress is important is because people need to make progress towards a meaningful purpose. They need to know that their hard work is paying off and they need to celebrate the excitement and sense of wonder that goes with, yes, we did it. I remember um, one of my instructors is in the audience here, Sheila, and we won this huge grant project one time, and I was ready to just jump right in. And somebody in our group said, um, well, can we celebrate the fact that we got the grant? And I was like, yeah, I guess we should do that. Because if you just keep plugging away, you, don't, you get kind of burned out. You don't ever stop and say, oh, we actually did that. If you don't take time for that, life is frustrating and you feel stuck. You sense that your task purpose is slipping away. Uh, you feel helpless, ineffective, and you will likely burn out and drop your commitment. Okay? Now, we're close to break time, and I'm pretty sure, oh, well, this is just the last slide I have on this. If any of you are going back into leadership, remember that the leadership role for these intrinsic motivators is that as the leader or manager, your job is to inspire people or help them tap into their inspiration in that first one. Um, your role in this one, and um, number two, choice, is to be willing to hand off um, and delegate whole purposes, whole tasks to people. I did this in my family. I have five children. My oldest just turned 31 yesterday. And um, when they were little, my household was designed so that they would feel empowered, lovable, connected, and contributing. So we would do things like we would put all the dishes low in the um, cabinet for even the little ones to set the table. We would put the milk in a pitcher for the two-year-old so she could go and pour her own milk. We wanted to do anything that we could help them do what they were capable of doing themselves. And we would do family meetings, and the family would take turns rotating the, um, the meetings. And I remember one time we had a meeting that we were asked to do in front of a large audience of adults. Uh, teachers and parents, and we had the five-year-old at the time run the meeting because we wanted to demonstrate that she could do that, and she wanted to, to do it. 
And we used to give the kids the entire budget for the groceries and send them off to the store. And that was before there were cell phones, so they'd have the little you know, dimes and put it in the phone and call us and say, we're done. But the checkout people would say, they gave you over $100, you know? And yeah, we had to make sure we didn't go over and um, that kind of thing. That is a way, that's a, a simple example and a home example of where you delegate a whole task. Now, there weren't a lot of families at that time doing that, sending their kids to the grocery store with a big wad of money because people don't think to delegate an entire task to somebody and have them pick it up. And that's very exciting to people. So you want to make sure that you give, um, hand off some things to them and, and assure them that, you know, and, and for you as the employable, offer that that's important to you, that you want to take on whole tasks and that you'll fulfill on those tasks and that you have, even have your ideas of how you would go about doing those tasks. Because some of you have some things in you you want to let out, you want to do. Um, in the competency area, the leadership capacity, and this is true for yourself internally, is coaching. Get the coaching you need. Get your skills training. If you need help with some area that has to do with relationships, get help there. If it's with productivity, get help there. If it's with your engagement level, find out what you need to do. Maybe it's exercise more. Who knows? But ask yourself the questions. What do I need to do to be fully competent in all areas? What kind of help or support or training do I need to put myself through? And then um, for your progress, you want to make sure that you're tracking, that you're paying attention, that maybe you're even cataloging. These are the things I'm doing well, so that you are not overlooking those. So this is kind of the process. You create, you commit to a meaningful purpose. You choose activities that will help you accomplish that purpose. Then you, um, and we're, we're gonna talk about creating what by when kind of things, where you're actually spelling out, I'm gonna do this by here. And then um, how will you strategize around that? What are the procedures you'll use for that? And how will I report those results? Who will witness those results? Then you'll perform those activities and you monitor to make sure that you're where you wanna be. Where a lot of times what I'll do is I'll say uh, to people, are you at a 10? When you think about your relationships in your life, are you at a 10 with all of them? If you're not, what would make them a 10? That's kind of a question that will help you to monitor your competence. Am I at a skill level of 10 on this? What would it take for me to get there? Okay, and then um, you monitor whether you're achieving that. Well, welcome back everybody. Hope you had a good break. Um, I was speaking with a few people on the break. It was great. Um, wish I could talk to every one of you and find out what you're up to and what you're doing. Uh, Roby, there you go. Roby just shared something I thought it was kind of uh, fitting for this. If you want to give him a microphone right here. Thanks. By the way, isn't that amazing that there's 60 people supporting you guys? That just still floors me. Go ahead. I was sharing with her, when I worked in Cleveland at a shopping center, I had the secretary, I'll use the word whiny, and there's probably another word. Um, and she was complaining about doing this report that went to the home office. It was probably 20 pages and very lots of envelopes and just a task she didn't like doing. She said, I hate doing this report. And I said, well, Cindy, the rent for the stores don't start until you get that to the home office. And she said, well, I still hate doing it, but at least now I know why I have to do it. And, you know, just understanding why you have to do things is really important in our task. Yes. It's a, it's a great example of task purpose. And you want to also know what task purpose you're operating out of as well. I have a story that I just um, thought of as you were saying that. Sometimes we give a good task purpose and sometimes we give a not so good, good task purpose. Um, there was a, a little boy, he was probably four or five years old, at the grocery store with his mom. And I was passing by them and he said to the mom, how come we can't park in that spot right there? It was the handicap spot. And she says, well, do you see on there on that sign it says $200, we'll get in trouble if we, if we park there. Now, I would not say that that's the highest task purpose. Like the task purpose I would have rather him had was, we're so lucky that we have legs that work well. And we can walk as far as we need to go to get to the store, and there are some people that don't. And so as a community, we're going to take care of them, make sure that they can get to the store as easily as you and I can. That would be a task purpose also. But can you see how one is coming from fear and the other is coming from service and love? 
And that's really the inside job. Same with those uh, folks in um, Auschwitz, you know. Some of them uh, had a really negative task purpose to kind of hate their, uh, their guards and to be um, in resistance to what was occurring to them. Others worked in the capacity of how can I be of service to others in this? How can I look for the good in this? And they tended to be healthier, uh, survive easier, and all of that. Um, it's just kind of a side effect of it. It's not always a guarantee, but it's certainly, even if you died sooner, you'd probably have a better time of it knowing that you were doing something that was actually in alignment with the truth of you. So we're going to talk about alignment. And clarity. A lot of times people don't have alignment in their personal lives or they don't have alignment with their organization. And I would encourage you, wherever you go next, to understand what's important to the people that you work for so that you're in alignment with their highest vision and their highest mission for the business and make sure that you, know, you can align with that. Because a lot of times when I work with organizations, they don't have, the people that work for them don't have a, uh, an understanding of what the mission and the values and all of that are and what order those need to go in. And if they have the clarity, they may not have the alignment. They may not have the approval of it. So sometimes we know our role. We know our goals. We might not be in agreement with those. So it's important that you understand how to do both of those. So everything we do is purposeful. Um, one of the things that I said in our, or that David kind of reiterated in the introduction was that we're always motivated. So everything we're doing has a reason. Now, if you notice in here, there's three different archers. And it looks like some of those arrows could hit center and some might not. And the important thing about this picture is to remember that everything we do has an intention and creates a result. So let's say you're a married couple. And you're, I'm going to just say you're the husband or the wife. I guess we could just say it either way. And you go out on a date with your partner. And you say, I'm going to have this really romantic, wonderful evening. But at the end of the night, you end up on the couch in a fight. The target was not hit, right? Does that mean the intention wasn't there? No, the intention was there. But there was another intention that became a higher priority that you might not be aware of. It might be that during dinner, you started to have a fight. And it became a higher priority to be right than it did, it did to be close. So you see? Like my target might be I want to lose 10 pounds at, at the end of the month. And by the end of the month, if I haven't lost 10 pounds, um, it doesn't mean that I don't want to lose 10 pounds. It just means that the hot fudge Sunday took a higher priority to losing 10 pounds. Okay? So you want to know what your higher intention is. And sometimes we're ashamed of or uncomfortable with our higher intention. And we don't recognize that we actually got a result that was very consistent with our intention. We just didn't want to look at the intention. Some of us have unconsciously lost jobs on purpose. Okay. We're always um, self-determining. To be fully engaged, you need to recognize that we're always creating our own reality. And it's powerful. So there's no neutral. You're not really sitting on a fence anywhere. You're either part of your solution or part of your problem. And um, you're either actively doing that or not doing that. So this is a, a slide I use in a lot of different things. Some of you may have seen this before. It's called the iceberg model. I really want to mainly focus on the first half of it. And that is that. Um, what you notice is that you're actually, um, what you notice in yourself and other people is their behavior. You see what's showing up on the surface. But you don't see what's below the behavior. And I don't suggest that we all become psychotherapists, because not all of us want to be. But um, it's important to have some cursory understanding of what's below that line of the behavior. And the first thing that you know today is those core needs. Those are always driving us. And um, we create a system for how we have to operate and what we believe is possible to get those needs met. Just like Christina, who I saw you eating that chocolate, wondered if you were going into a sugar coma. If you fall asleep back there, I'm going to have them wake you up. But um, we'll actually create values and beliefs for how we think that can be done. And those will be limited, because our beliefs are often limited beliefs. And um, we actually will create thoughts and feelings that support our belief system. And we'll weed out thoughts and feelings and ignore thoughts and feelings that don't agree with our value system. And all of it shows up in the reflection of our behavior. And so um, sometimes what we're going to be working on today is how do we actually identify the beliefs and the values here in a way that actually serves our needs to the highest. If you're influencing other people, 
Um, one of the things that you'll learn to do is build trust with them at the behavioral level and actually start to identify some of their thoughts and feelings that are not serving them and facilitate change on the values and beliefs level in a way that meets their needs. A really good, highly socially um, intelligent person is able to do that without using control and harshness and all of that. Uh, another thing to remember is that we're always looking through our own lens. And even though that sounds kind of like a duh, well, yeah, of course we're not seeing things the same. It's really way bigger than we know. You know, like my highest priority value is for you guys to be competent. Someone else's might be harmony. Someone else's might be for stability. Somebody else's might be for freedom and fun. So you're looking through your lens, I'm looking through my lens. And it's more different than we know. So that's not how I remember it. Where are they coming from? Huh? How is it we see things so differently? And it's just important to remember that because a lot of times we're making a lot of assumptions about things. Um, and they're, they're often wrong, most of the time wrong. We're great observers but poor interpreters. So, we're very subjective. We have this private logic. And the way that we develop a belief is we have these events that happen to us. And a lot of this has happened before we were even consciously aware of it when we were little. But we have events happen to us and we interpret them a certain way. And when we do, we have emotional and physical responses to what we've witnessed. Somebody could see something horrifying and find it exciting. Somebody else could see something horrifying and find it horrifying. You know, I mean, it's just a different interpretation and a different physiological and emotional response. But we make decisions about it about myself, about my behavior, about what I can do. All of this is fluid to some extent if we become conscious of it. And then we create beliefs, beliefs about our life, about men, uh, women and men and power and work. And a lot of times we actually need to consciously break um, our question of belief because what we'll do is we'll filter out any event that would support something different. And that includes how we feel about ourselves. So a lot of our beliefs, um, might be distorted, but they serve us. And a lot of our beliefs might be distorted in a way that don't serve us. And we just want to notice, where is it not working? Where might there be some limiting beliefs that I could challenge? Okay? We're also subjective. We want what Adler called a felt plus. We want to feel empowered, lovable, connected, and contributing. And so we're always trying to do that. So no matter how you're feeling, know that you're trying to move toward empowerment. You're trying to move toward a feeling of being lovable and connected and contributing. And then take steps that you, once you're conscious of that, take steps that help you get there quicker. And assume a positive intention about yourself and other people. Not that people are trying to do something bad. Even the worst behavior is an attempt for somebody to feel empowered or an attempt for them to feel better. So we're going to talk about alignment. And I'm going to have you all do a little bit of exercise on this. But um, I want to walk you through the various steps. When we went through the intrinsic motivators of sense of meaningfulness, sense of choice, um, sense of competency or, you know, and skill, and sense of progress, those are actually, they have to be done in that order. If you don't have one, you can't really move on to the next. And that's similar to this. To be in good alignment, these things need to be in place, ideally in this order. So the mission is, why do I exist? I'm going to talk in terms of I, but if it's an organization, it's why do we exist? So what's my purpose beyond my survival? So I know you all want a job because you want to survive. That's reasonable. But beyond that, what do you want to cause? The values are, how do I need to operate? What are the standards that I need to operate by, my ways of being and doing, that will help me live my mission? Now, my vision is the current expression of that mission. A lot of times, people don't know the difference between. What's the difference between a mission and a vision? A mission never changes. A mission is bigger than the way that we're expressing it. Like. Um, well, we'll talk about that as we go into how you guys discover a mission. But just know a mission will never change as long as, uh, even if your body, you know, you get, God forbid, something where you were paralyzed and it would limit how many ways you could express that mission. 
or your conditions would change. Um, you could still live your mission, okay? But the vision is the particular way that I want to express the mission right now in my life. And then from that, the goals uh, follow. And then from that, you set the procedures that help you meet those goals, that help you meet those visions. And then from that, you get clear about who does what. Sometimes you're going to find out if by the time you define all this that you're not the person to fulfill certain pieces of that. But you don't know it until you have your plan laid out. Now, I have a man that I'm working with right now. He's very wealthy, very successful businessman. Um, he never has used a coach or mentor. He's been the coach or mentor in his particular industry. And um, his uh, marriage fell apart unexpectedly, just dropped off the grid. And his kids, he realized he didn't have relationships with his kids, his older kids. And so when I started working with him, I said, we're going to start at square one and talk about your mission. He's, oh, no, I've already done that mission vision stuff. And I said, you really haven't. Or if you have, you didn't do it in a way that was really serving you because your family wouldn't have fallen off the grid. And he said, okay. And he's discovering his mission now and discovering how to create his vision in a way that will um, serve the, you know, the highest vision that he's holding. So a lot of you may feel that you've already done this, and you may have, but hopefully you'll, you know, you'll learn some new things about it. Why do we want alignment? When you are aligned with your purpose, your values, and your vision, you'll see your work as meaningful. You'll see your life as meaningful. You'll look forward to waking up and going to work. You'll have a sense of pride in what you do. And you'll have pride in the company you work for and the role that you play in it. Just like uh, that woman had a little more, more of a sense of purpose. And if you're not, what's going to happen is the right work doesn't get done. Or the right work gets done, but it doesn't get done right. OK? Anybody have any questions so far or comments about anything? OK, yes. Well, thanks for coming today, Judy. Uh, is it best to have uh, your mission from the previous slide uh, more broadly defined or more specifically defined? And say your vision, uh, no doubt, has to be more specific. But uh, from a mission standpoint, uh, is it best to have it more broadly than, than more specific? Well, let, we're going to go right into that. So good question. Good, good segue. We're going to talk more specifically about mission. And I'm going to give you some examples. So the mission is around why I exist. What do I want to cause? And what you want to be asking yourself around mission, and I encourage people that are in a company, like uh, especially the owners of a company, I encourage them to create a mission for their business and a mission for their life. And I also brought an example of setting a mission for each project, because you can do the same process with it. So, what is a worthy legacy for me? What do I want on my tombstone? If I could put a word on my tombstone or a phrase on my tombstone. Like for me, my mission is to create a world in which adults and children love their lives. If I had that phrase on my tombstone, I'd feel like I was leaving a worthwhile legacy. Um, you also want to ask um, something. We're gonna, I'll take you through an exercise in a little bit. When did I experience the most passion, the most excitement, and the most joy? And we're going to do an exercise where you're going to look at some times when you've experienced this, and you're going to see some common threads between those three incidents. And it'll help you to get in touch with a mission that you've always had in you that you may not be aware of consciously. Um, the individual personal mission, this one is mine, create a world where all adults and children love their lives. And, and this is a good example of an organizational mission statement. Uh, have you, any of you read Delivering Happiness? It's an excellent book by Tony Shea. And his name is spelled H-S-I-E-H. -E it's excellent. It's about creating um, healthy culture. And you can apply all of what he's talking about to the internal person as well. And he's very out of the box, very innovative. But their um, mission is so easy to remember. It's like a brand for me. It's called Delivering Happiness. But their um, whole organization is committed to creating a wow experience through service. 
And so um, what you want to remember about your mission is it should not be a, a, a plaque on a wall that's filled with a bunch of techno jargon. It should be something very compelling like Nike's just do it kind of thing, you know, that you can remember, that you can speak on every day, that you remind yourself when you're in a you know, negative space, what am I here to create? So it should be inspiring to you, it should be compelling to you, it should be very memorable. It should be something you can call up regularly. It should be like a well-known brand or tagline, okay? And um, this is a customer of mine. Her, that's the CEO of a company, her individual personal mission is to encourage all to fulfill on highest vision. And her company's corporate um, mission statement is to be a catalyst that ensures all have confidence and shine. So when we're in meetings and um, we're talking, we always open the meetings with, now remember, this meeting is about helping each other have confidence and shine and how to help the clients have confidence and shine. And the reason those words are uh, in bold is because those are their touchstone words. And highest vision and encourage are her personal touchstones. It's helpful even to me because when I'm working with them, I'm remembering their touchstones. Oh, remember, you wouldn't do this if you wanted to encourage um, highest vision. How do I clarify my mission? So this is what I want you to do. I gave out some cards, and I don't know, David, if you're in the room still, or do you have those? They're just little, oh, you know what? They're right here. Didn't mean to freak anybody out. If you guys can just hand those out. What I want you to do is I want you to think of three memories that stand out in which you felt the most alive, the most connected, and the most fulfilled. And um, like I remembered, I was thinking about mine. What are mine? I can remember two of mine. One of them was I was in fifth grade, and I was really having a rough time. I was in a school I didn't like. I was overweight. I felt not good about myself. And I had tried so hard to get people to like me. And you know how it is in life when you try to get somebody to like you? It doesn't work. And it didn't feel good. And I remember in the summer between fifth and sixth grade, I remember walking to my new school right at the end of summer and making a decision that I wasn't going to try to get people to like me anymore, that I was just going to be myself and people were either going to like it or they weren't. And I remember going into my new school year and doing that and finding that I became more and more popular without even trying. It was an incredible experience for me. And I forgot it after a while because I went on to the next middle school and then I, you know, trying to hang on to the popularity I'd gained and never lost it all the way but had forgotten that. So it was really important for me to remember. So when I say creating a world in which people love their lives, it means their lives. Like I, I could see with my children, the reason I raised them the way that I raised them is because I had a very loving, good family. But as is uh, that era, it was like you should be this. You will be Catholic. You will, be, you will think this way. You will be this political persuasion. And I didn't always fit in those boxes. And it was hard for me to be a good child to my parents and also be who I was here to be. So I can tell that there's always been these roots in me that wanted to, um, that I felt most alive when I help people to be who they are here to be. Another one was I was teaching a class one time, and this man came up to me, and he said, um, he was in a, a really long program with me, never spoke during the program. I never knew if he hated it or loved it. I guess I assumed he loved it okay because he was coming to the sessions. And he came up to me afterwards, and he said, you know, I, um, you're one of the people I'll never forget because I did not know what I was doing with my son that was getting in the way of our relationship. And, um, and I wasn't even teaching a parenting class. It was a, a class for a company, and he had tears in his eyes. And that um, helped me to realize my mission. So I want you to take some time. Think of three memories that stand out. And, um, and then what you want to find out what, um, what's common to the three. Like for me, it was somehow um, creating this decision, helping people come to a decision around being who they are here to be. What were you doing, deciding, and causing? I was doing myself. I was expressing who I am 
I was helping others express who they are. So you want to see what you were doing, deciding, and causing that made you feel good. And it doesn't have to be anything that complex. It could be, I don't know, one of my clients, his, one of his memories was when he got his first big wheel at Christmas. And his, but his mission is to create fun and adventure. And he's working in a job that's very dull, and he's trying to figure out ways to live to that mission. If you could describe it in one word or short phrase, what would you want on your tombstone? Oops, didn't mean to do that. So let's just take a, a couple minutes to do that, and then I'm going to have you guys partner up and just share that with somebody around you. Okay, I know you guys probably haven't finished it, but I want you to just go ahead and share it with the person in its state where it's at. So just go ahead and find somebody to partner up with. You can move around if you need to. We're only going to do this for a couple minutes, so. Anybody have any insights that they weren't aware of before this that would like to share anything around that? There's a microphone right there. She just helped me considerably after we discussed the really only two things that I had found. And then we did talk about the tombstone thing. And uh, she summed it up for me. I'm the type of person that see a need and then I get it done. So that was very helpful to me because I didn't know how to express that. Yes. And, yeah. So yes. now I know because I do see needs and I do know how to, and, and I will get it done. So yeah, that was very mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. Good. Anybody else see something that they hadn't been able to summarize or hadn't been able to see? Okay. There's one. Good. Oh, I just have to share this, Judy. You know, every time I do this exercise, it's something different. I actually had something different written down, and just from communicating this exercise with other people, it clarified what I wanted to say. So that was just a great observation. Okay, great. Do you want to share it or just wanted to say that? Oh, yeah, I just wanted to say okay. that. Okay, all right. <laughs> if you all want to hear it, I can tell you. <laughs> Anybody else? I know this is just a, a, a little start. I just wanted you to have a start on it. This is something that's on your handouts. It's a reminder of what the mission is. You want to sit with this. It doesn't have to be anything you do very, you know, real quickly. But you want it to be something that feels like it just sinks into place for you and that it inspires you on a regular basis. Let's talk about values. The values are how I must operate to live that mission. How do I have to be and act? It's both a being and a behavior. The things you want to remember about your values are do my ways of operating put my life at a 10? So if, if the customer that I'm talking about is all about helping to create confidence and shine, but we have gossip in our environment, is that helping us do confidence and shine at a 10? That's the kind of stuff you're measuring against. Like um, one of my clients, her mission is to uh, support through fun and adventure. And she likes innovative things. So one of her values is improvisation. Now that's an interesting value. I, I hadn't thought of that one. But it, it fits for her mission. So do my ways of operating put my life at a 10? Her life is at a 10 when she gets to improvise. That's why it was a 10 for her. Are my values aligned with my mission and purpose? Sometimes when we look at the way we're operating and being, it doesn't even fit our mission. And so there might be some habits to let go of, some behaviors to let go of. If I'm creating a life I love, because um, I include myself, that's the other thing about your mission. It should always be about all. Not I help others, I help all to solve problems. Because that all has to include yourself. So that's an important thing to remember. Now. This is the one that I was telling you about a minute ago, the corporate one, the CEO's personal and company mission. For her to fulfill on these missions, what do you think some of her values would have to be? Yes. Encouraging others. Being a positive. So she said positive and encouraging. Those would be two values. Anybody else? 
What else would you have to have to be able to live to that mission, those missions? Yes? Recognize it. So what would you have to do to recognize it? Tell them. P tell them and pay attention to see them, right? Both. Yes? I think it's also a matter of trust and what she said. Mm -hmm. Build trust. Build strong relationships, right? Okay. So let's see what she put. First, she had to be a good listener to be able to listen for highest vision, listen for confidence. She has to be an encourager. Somebody said that. Um, she has to find, model, witness, courage, and commitment. She has to cultivate positivity, which I think would include building that positive relationship that's always built on trust. Trist is always the, um, the first cornerstone of that. Um, having social responsibility, hel helping people live with social interest, caring about one another. Inspire leadership, model leadership. Be a visionary herself. How can she see high vision in people if she doesn't have a high vision? You can't give away what you don't have. So do you see, um, when examples develop their values, they condensed them down from like 58 values into 10 value statements. And they gave their people over a year to do that. And they um, combined certain ones and everything. It's, so you don't want to rush your values. Like I'm always adding some to mine. You know? uh, she also needs to capture and track, like we talked about, so that she can measure success and help people recognize it. So she's got to be that cheerleader. So your vision is your specific expression of the mission right now for yourself or the organization. So it could be for both. So right now you have a specific vision. Um, what do I imagine myself or us achieving in the next year or the next five years? What measurable outcomes am I reaching for now? Now they don't all have to be measurable, but you want at least a couple of them to be. So these are hers. Successfully empower her direct reports. Build a powerful team that propels growth. Create an atmosphere of reflection, opening of the mind. Building security, which is that trust. Uh, modeling my life as a person who's confident and shines. So she has to do her own inner work, right? So that she can live and be. So that value system is not just a way of doing, it's a way of being. Decrease the trust gap. One of the things that we measure is the gap on the, there's eight values that build trust, um, like for example, straightforwardness and honesty and fulfilling on commitments. And what people do is they say, this is uh, on a scale of one to 10, this is a 10 for me, this is important to me, but I think it's only being fulfilled at a five in my, in my group, and that's the trust gap. And so one of her goals is to decrease the trust gap because when it's been proven that when you retreat, uh, increase trust and decrease the gap, um, there's higher revenues, all kinds of good things that come from that. So that's one of her measurable. These two bottom ones are her measurable ones. So you want to have at least a couple you can say, I arrived. Then what you do is you set your goals from that. What the goals are, what I or the organization need to do in the short run to achieve the mission and the vision. So that, then your goals are driven from something meaningful. So if her vision, so you want to say, do my goals capture the what by when? Do I have a reporting or witnessing process in place? And that's not so that somebody else holds you accountable. It's so that somebody else celebrates with you. And that you remember, oh, I've got to report this. It's helpful to you to know that it's, it matters to someone. So her, one of her vision statements was to successfully empower others, especially her direct reports. Well, just one of her goals, this is just one, is to establish a mentoring process with the mid-level managers because they're moving from a control-based environment to a responsibility-based environment. So she wants to make sure her mid-level managers are putting in fact you know, the things that they need to be doing. And she wants to have meetings with them so that she's mentoring them around that and getting reports from them on how the staff development and performance metrics are moving. So she wants the process in place by October 31st. She will set up regular mentoring sessions. She'll identify the processes for those meetings. She'll identify the action items for those. And she'll identify the business operations to be reported. Now here's where she puts her procedures in. Well, I've got to schedule the meetings. I've got to make a schedule for them. I've got to create an agenda. Um, I've got to decide what assessment tools, what kind of training goals I have. And then in this case, I'm the person that she reports to on this. Now think about this on your personal life. Let's say it's to be physically fit is one of your vision statements. 
I want to be physically fit. And one of your goals is to lose 20 pounds. And you might have five strategies, or two, who knows? Like one might be take healthy cooking classes. One might be uh, journal my food intake. Um, one might be find a support partner, exercise a certain amount of time. And your procedures might be join a gym. So it's not like this is just work. But you want to be able to see how it all maps to your vision, because this kind of thing is going to inspire you if you've done it in an inspirational way. Does that make sense? What most people do is they jump in at this level. They start setting goals, making all these plans, but there's no rhyme or reason. That's why that man's marriage kind of fell off the grid, because he was doing a lot of stuff. He was working very hard, and he was making a lot of money. He just wasn't necessarily aligned with everything that he really wanted. So the right work got done, but it didn't get done right. Um, that's the end of that, but I do want to share with you one other thing before we stop, and that's just an example of a project where we did um, um, the mission, the purpose, the values, and the mission, and the vision. This is a project with a guy that he owns a football team, and it's uh, to help take young men off the street who are getting into a lot of trouble. And he's been very successful with this team, even won a Hall uh, of Fame award for it. And he wants to create a documentary and have them all go through like a leadership development program and, um, you know, and make a documentary of that and have that be something that they're proud of, their progress, help them all find employment, that kind of thing. And so his project had a purpose. His project had values. His project had vision statements. And then his goals and procedures all follow that. So that's an example of how even if you have something you want to do um, for your community or for your business or for your employment, um, you can create it as a project and it, it will also fit into this model. Does anybody have any questions? I think we're just about finished. I want to make sure you have time if you have anything that you need to ask about this or anything else that I've talked about today. No questions? Wow. I've either overwhelmed you or underwhelmed you. I don't know which one. Overwhelmed? Well, I hope I haven't overwhelmed too bad. And if, uh, if I have, you guys have that information to kind of refer back to in the bite-sized pieces you might want. I told you I was a nerd right from the beginning. <laughs> yes? Just, um, I feel over not overwhelmed in a bad way. There's been a lot of excellent Good. information today. Good. Do you have a website that you I do. Have in fact, or? I will just say this. If any of you want, I have a, a, a card up here that just gives my information. I also have about 25 of my latest article that just my publisher just dropped them off at my house the other day, so I just grabbed them and brought them. Um, if, it's on gossip. It's called The Good Reasons We Gossip and um, What to Do Instead, and it talks about healthy venting and things, and I think a lot of people might enjoy that. So if anybody wants that, um, you're welcome to come up and see me about that. Okay. You've all been a great audience. I see lots of um, really wonderful responses in your faces. And I'm, as a speaker, I'm very grateful for that. And this is my passion. And I'm um, real happy that I had the opportunity to do this. And if it helped in any way, I'm thrilled. So thank you. <laughs>